So very happy to be here, and thank you, Sergey, for uh, bringing me on stage. Um, so Euroclean is a financial market infrastructure. Uh, so we see that in the center of an ecosystem, uh, basically, and we have a group of central security depositories. And to give you the sense of the size that we have, we have more than 38 trillion of euro under custody, and we process a quadrillion operation a year, operating in more than 50 critical markets. So that's, you know, just giving a, a, a sense of scale that everything we do has a strong impact on the market. Right, so, so let me just repeat that number very quickly. 38 trillion yes. euros. I see. Great. Thank you very much, Jorgen. That's, you know, very, very significant and powers. I know a lot of the clearing and settlement for a lot of the world and, and other very meaningful things. So I, I'm just curious, what does your organization, what are your views on why digital assets are, are interesting, and why did Euroclear go in this direction of, of having an interest in working on digital assets? So before answering this question, I think it's important to, to remind a little bit the role of financial market infrastructure. And we exist for more than five decades, and when you look at everything that had happened from uh, uh, innovation, should it be technological innovation, financial innovation, or any crisis, well, guess what? Financial market infrastructures have been able to support basically all the ecosystem and the growth of capital market through all this innovation. And tomorrow is going to be no different. So should it be DLT, AI, quantum, you name it, we're going to be here to support the growth of the capital market. And I think that we went into this space because it was very important for us to remain relevant for the client. Mm -hmm. And when you look at basically everything that happened, there is a strong market readiness mm -hmm. that we cannot ignore. If you look from uh, across all the value chain, from pre-insurance, issuance, payments, collateral, mm -hmm. payments, everything, every major player have been testing uh, uh, basically uh, this, the transformative nature and promise of this technology. Mm -hmm. It's fair to say that everyone has actually found a sweet spot, identified the real problem, and actually built a solution for that. Yeah. But we have to recognize as well that there is no such scale that at the level it should be or it could be. And this is what we're trying to solve, actually. So yeah, digital assets is a key focus for us, high important because it can definitely transform uh, the way we operate today. Got it. Ma makes sense. So, so basically, you saw greater client demand, greater client interest more adoption you know, by your user base of DLT technology generally, and that signaled that this was worth uh, exploring and working on more. I would add two things to that. I think that not only you had market readiness, but you had as, as well regulatory readiness, which is very important for our institution. We are super regulated. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the work the central banks have done on the CBDC in quite a few years, pretty impressive. And when you look at the fact that they are creating specific re regulatory environments to allow new entrants, global financial institutions, or incumbents to actually test the value of DLT, it shows clearly that they want us to go in that direction. And on top of that, you have, you have as well some uh, technological maturity. So all three together creates a great momentum. Market readiness, regulatory readiness, and technological maturity. Got it. Ma makes sense. Yeah, just one, one nuance about Euroclear. It's an international CSD. So it's an ICSD that works across many jurisdictions. Yeah. So you interact with many different regulators. And, and so your view is not only was there more client I interest and market readiness, but that the regulatory environment also was encouraging of this in some of the jurisdictions where you guys operate. And so that was another force driving. Exactly. Exactly. M makes sense. That's, that's great. Great to hear. Um, so recently you folks have released the Digital Assets Securities Control Principles Framework, and I'm just very interested to hear what that is and what the goal of that is and, and how that works. You know, that goes back to the question of uh, what with adoption. And I have a question for you on adoption afterwards. But today we still are facing, you know, um, some limitation when we look at something that can be actually huge as you presented before, and that's very promising. And we have tried to reset kind of a baseline with our colleagues from DTCC and Clearstream to basically say, okay, we want to have a strong market engagement with our clients 
to basically define, okay, what are the control principles that would make sense mm -hmm. if we need to actually scale and get to mass adoption when it comes to uh, digital asset securities. Mm -hmm. And that's key because every other quarter you have a new paper coming left and right, but I think it's the first time ever that we have put it at a global scale, looking at more than 12 juris jurisdictions, more than 80 industry papers, trying to figure out okay. which region is focusing on what, what are the discrepancies here and there, and how can we actually, as an ecosystem, progress. But when I look at you know, uh, all the work that Chainlink is doing, what do you think are the um, technical capabilities that digital asset needs today to actually get to the mass adoption? Yeah, so I, I think at, at the end of the day, the blockchain technology itself needs to scale. Yeah. And the scalability needs, needs to improve. I think you need connectivity with various systems. So connectivity with data and connectivity with existing backends through swift messages to existing standards. So the connectivity to all the data and all the systems in the financial system needs to happen. And then I think the third property that's uh, really needed for real large scale mass adoption is the guarantee of privacy. So proving um, that privacy exists and that transactions are either broken up in a certain way or encrypted in a certain way, that privacy for those transactions will exist. On a technical level, which is the level that we focus on, once the scalability of the blockchains, once the connectivity to all the data resources, um, risk systems, accounting systems, bank systems exists, and once the guarantees of privacy for certain key parts of the transaction can be there, then you can, you can kind of hit mass adoption. I, I, I guess there's another level I, I think about more and more as I meet with central banks and CSDs mm -hmm. and others, which is the level of um, legal basically, and compliance, which is, I know, the level you're very involved in. But I, I think what, what you've just said, as I've understood it, is that there's a lot of progress there where people are basically starting to come to agreement that there needs to be simple, clear rules about how transactions can happen. And so the, the legal barrier to transactions happening is, from, from what I've heard from, your previous, from the previous discussion we just had and now this, this point, is that that barrier is slowly eroding away so that people can do transactions not only in their own jurisdiction, but cross-jurisdictionally. Is, is that right? That's correct. And, and honestly, I think that's, that's a critical uh, missing step today that, that we need, actually, to get this adoption. And that's why we have basically started with the, the control principles. What are the principles that we need to be able to progress? What are the risks that we have identified? And what are the controls that we need to put in place to get there? And then obviously, we want to engage with the market to progress on that. And the last piece that we're, we still need to progress on is the standards. But what is important for us is the market engagement just to get this, this clear baseline. Because today, it's so different. But there is definitely a, a good momentum to, to go forward on this. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I, th I think the thing that I've seen is that all of these legal standards and compliance statements about how transactions work also need to get implemented in some technical way. Yep. So they need to be invoked on chain, data needs to go on chain, there need to be guarantees that smart contracts will work a certain way to guarantee compliance and to guarantee that these legal conditions are met. So, so that's the point of view from which I am thinking about these things usually, is I'm trying to learn as much as I can about what those requirements are, so that technically they can become kind of a second thought, because you have an Oracle, an Oracle network, so, something that basically implements them efficiently on chain in an, e in an easy way. So, and that's going to be critical capabilities that we actually need. Mm -hmm. But we have to think of it you know, in two levels. I think that from a technological point of view, and you have proven it, we have all the pieces of the puzzles. Obviously, we need to progress there, but it has to go hand in hand with all the regulation part and the legal part, and all that together can actually help us progress. But for that as well, it will require the market to focus a little bit on what's going to move the needle forward. And this market uh, engagement towards strong use case, should it be on collateral mobility, should it be on corporate action, should it be on issuance or whatever real-world assets, which is a very hot topic, 
having more focus and bringing people together is going to help us definitely progress in the right direction at the right pace. That makes sense. What, I agree. What, what do you think is, is next for the mass adoption of blockchain technology from the TradFi industry? So for it to scale and, and gain this mass adoption. So what's, what's your view on that? <laughs> to be honest, I think that most of the players are thinking about that. Mm-hmm. And, and as I told you, what's top of the agenda today when you, when you talk to market participants is definitely funds tokenization. You have private markets, real world asset, but most and foremost collateral mobility. There's, an, there's something there that if we're able to actually bring that on chain and have like a seamless connection between the cash, the assets, regardless of the location in a safe and secure way, you can actually unlock end to end the promised value of, of the technology. Because today you still have some pieces of the value that are materialized, but because you have some breaks in the systems and it doesn't go yet end to end at the scale it could or it should, you are still don't have all the incentive to move from the million to the billions and from the billions to the trillions. <laughs> from the billions to the trillions, huh? <laughs> That's the end game. Sounds right. Um, so I, I know you've also done a lot of interesting work on DFMI yeah. and uh, some work with the World Bank. Could you share with us what, what that was about? So basically, when we had to start our digital asset journey, we engaged a lot with clients because you know client centricity and co-creation is key. We didn't want to develop something that was going to sit somewhere and not being used. Mm-hmm. And long story short, we discussed with the buy side and we discussed with the sell side and we got a clear mandate to basically say, you know what? Buy side is not ready to go fully on there, but they're getting there. Nevertheless, we found a, you know, a group of innovative uh, ecosystem around issuer, issuer agent, and, and dealers that have said, okay, let's try something different. And, but they had some conditions. We want real DLT, meaning we don't just want a position sitting on a ledger, etc. We want most and foremost, no compromise on liquidity. So the way we managed to actually uh, find that is basically to have all the primary market distribution on chain with DVP atomic settlement and thanks to our infrastructure, we're able to have cash on chains so we're not dependent on any external cash leg. And then we can create a seamless connection to the, to the traditional what, what, what does no compromise on liquidity mean? It means that as long as you don't have all the buy side that is ready to actually move to a tokenized world, right. you, World Bank needs liquidity. Right. All the big issuers needs liquidity. And that was the missing piece. So what we have done is rather very vanilla. But it's vanilla for a reason. Everyone likes vanilla. And you can actually, you can actually compare apples and apples. And that's a strong message. So yes, it's not pure and perfect from a DLT perspective. Right. But today, it works, and you can have all the investor reach you want. Right, so, so basically the traditional payment method can be used yeah. to execute um, on-chain transactions, and in executing on-chain transactions or finalizing them, you get a different kind of uh, scale from the liquidity point of view, and who can participate. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the yeah. So I, 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 th- I, think, I think that's right. I think this is the type of thing where you're starting to merge the traditional system's great benefits of so much liquidity, so many great participants, and you're starting to merge them with DLT in, in a useful way. But that's valid for today. Right. That's not the end game. We all know that it has to progress, but that's how it works today. But now a question for you, because you know I've been following all the success of uh, chainings over the year, the years, and you know, we see you are much and more and more involved in the capital market space. So what next for Chainlinks in the capital markets? Yes, I, I think our goal is to create a low level uh, standard yeah. for information and value to flow into, out of, and across chains. So I think there's gonna be a level, a layer of interfaces where users, institutional users and retail users interact with blockchains through those interfaces. There's gonna be a lower level be- below that of the smart contracts and those smart contracts will exist in various frameworks. 
and those frameworks will define how tokenization works legally, how tokenization works for different types of assets. And then below that, there's the infrastructure that those smart contracts run on. And that infrastructure is basically blockchains and Oracle networks and their associated protocols to give those smart contracts data, to connect them across chains, to, to make all of that work. And so I, I think there's a really big role to play at that low level of defining the standards uh, with which data flows across chains and with which connectivity happens uh, between both chains and other chains and chains and existing systems like yours and Swift and, and so on. And I think at, at the end of the day, those low level standards are what have historically led to the growth of various industries. They're not always super well understood because they're used by the people building the, the next le level up. And then the level that people understand is often the interface level or the level of services like the ones that you provide. But even your current systems are built on a whole bunch of existing web standards, right? HTTPS, TCP IP, a whole bunch of existing standards and technologies. And my view is that if value is going to migrate into this blockchain format, then you need that same set of low-level standards to migrate data, to migrate value, to do connectivity, to do all the same things that happen today in Web2. So that's, that's the kind of global set of standards that we're now in the process of making and you know, very lucky to be working with you know, some of the biggest and greatest folks in the capital markets. But, but what are your thoughts? You know, uh, the, the closer we get and the closer we are able to bring both ecosystems mm -hmm. with the, a, a level of standards and confidence that we can bring to the market because at the end of the day, people come to us because they trust us. And whenever there is a problem somewhere, they know who to call. And bringing this level of trust and scale, bringing the technological uh, advancement that you are basically bringing there and embracing the change and being able to progress forward to actually progress in the digital asset to era together, that's the clear path forward. I agree. Makes sense. So it's, it's been great chatting with you, Jurgen. I really appreciate Pleasure. you taking the time to share your, your insight and your thoughtful points of view with us. Thank you.